Um, some of you might know me, but in case you don't, my name is Cami Cannon. I'm the Vegetable IPM Associate at Utah State University with Extension and the Utah Pest Group. So being part of that group and as an integrated pest management associate, I want to focus today on identifying key vegetable pests and preparing a line of defense, um, which would be knowing when to look for them, um, knowing what your management options are, and knowing what indicates time for treatment. Um, so, um, economic losses in the U.S. Um, due to pests are as high as 40% in food crops. So um, that's a big amount. And even though they're only 1% of all the pests, all the insects, sorry, um, in the world are harmful, they can do a lot of damage when they are present, and especially when they're present in high numbers. Um, so there are a lot of things to do to help create a healthier harvest at the end of the season. But some of the things to do are to monitor for these pests um, and properly identify them. So knowing between the pests that are doing harm and the beneficial insects that are helping you. And um, gaining a knowledge of the key pests for your specific crops. So if you're growing tomatoes or if you're growing peppers, knowing what are the main pests for those crops and knowing a little bit more in-depth information about them, like their life cycle and how they overwinter. Um, and gaining this knowledge base will help you a lot when it's time to manage these pests and when it's not time to manage the pests, when it's okay to just let them be and not take any action yet. Um, so all of these things can help reduce economic losses and improve your harvest quality. So before I start, I just want to say that um, I won't be able to obviously cover all of the insect pests that some of you might encounter during the season because many of you grow um, different crops and I, there's just not enough time to talk about all of them. So I wanted to talk about the resources that are out there for you. Um, there are a lot of them and if you have any more questions, you can always email me and I can point you in the direction of um, any resources that you think you might need. But some of them are listed here. Um, one that I want to point, well, a couple I want to point out are the IPM advisories. If you're not signed up for those, those are great. They are sent out during the season um, and you can sign up for vegetables or fruits or turf or landscape ornamentals. So you can get updated um, current pest information for those areas and um, that just helps you know kind of what's going on and what to look out for. So if you haven't signed up for those, go to the utahpest.usu.edu and there's a spot for you to sign up for those. Um, there's also, if you're more of a visual learner, there's the USU Extension YouTube channel. And I have, that's what this picture is right over here. Um, they have tons of videos for you to watch. Um, they're really helpful on specific topics, like if you want to know how to trellis your tomatoes or get rid of squash bugs. Um, there are just lots of resources there, and we have a playlist. So if you go to their page and click on playlists and scroll down, you'll be able to see the Utah Pest playlist. And we, we put past webinars, webinars on there and other presentations that might be helpful. You also have your county extension agents that you can take things to if you need them identified. And if they can't identify them, they'll send them to the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostics Lab. Um, which does a little bit more in-depth diagnostics. So especially with plant diseases, that's a good place to go um, because they're often really hard to identify unless some special procedures are done with them. Um, there's also bugguide.net. That's a great place for helping you identify insects. So if you're seeing something out in the field and you're not sure what it is, you can Google what you think it might be and bugguide.net and, and it'll bring up a lot of pictures that you can compare what you're seeing to what's on that website. Um, let me talk about a little, a few more um, resources. This is a new resource. It's called the Vegetable Pests of Utah Disease and Arthropod Pest Identification Guide. So this guide is made for the sole purpose of being able to um, properly identify insects of Utah both insects and diseases, 
Um, and knowing a little bit of background information, you know, not too in depth, but enough that you can make some plans and get more information if you need to from there. So this is a new one just came out this spring. Um, and I'm just going to go through kind of what it looks like to help um, to help you get a little uh, oriented with the setup. So the first half is insect pests. And you can see up in the top, it'll indicate what what section you're in, and then there's diseases in the second half. And then you can see there's a list of categories of, of what's included. So one of the categories is aphids or beetles, caterpillars and moths for insects, and then for diseases, there are bacterial diseases, fungal diseases, and viral diseases. So the individual pages look like this, and you can see that you're in the beetles section with these tabs on the side. Um, and then it gives the common name for the insect pest or disease and then the scientific name. And then for the insects over on this right hand side you can see it'll give the size. Um, it's a size range and it's usually got at least the adult and sometimes the larval or nymphal size. Um, and it's a range so the you can see this dark line is the lower end of the range and from the beginning of the dark line to the end of the light line is the larger end of the range and so that's real size real um, length but from top to bottom that doesn't indicate anything about the insect that's just so you can see the line well but from left to right is the length of the insect so that kind of gives you an idea when you're seeing these insects out in the field you're able to to visualize what size they might be. And then, of course, there are pictures. So the diseases are similarly laid out. Um, a few differences are that it'll give the genus, um, if applicable, of the virus or uh, the disease. And then it'll show what causes the disease and how it is spread. So that's pretty good information to know um, when you're out there looking and when you're planning for the coming seasons, um, what you need to be aware of as far as how it's spread and what causes it. And then it gives the general information like host, symptoms, disease cycle, time for concern, when and where to scout, threat level, top management techniques, um, when to consider treatment, and lookalikes. And the lookalike section is pretty important especially for insects, I think, because properly identifying the insects and knowing their lookalikes is helpful, especially when there are beneficial insects that look like insect pests. So you want to be properly identifying the pests so that you're not accidentally treating um, beneficial insects that are there to help you. Um, so we're currently working on a beneficial guide that is the same setup as this so that you can compare pictures between the lookalikes and decipher which one you might be looking at in your own garden or farm. And then this is the back cover. It just shows um, it has a ruler in millimeters and inches so that you can um, see what size the insect you are looking at out in the field is if it's not running away from you, which a lot of them do. So another resource is the USUX, well actually sorry, um, the USU Extension Store is where this book will be available. It's not on there yet, um, but it's going to, and you can go onto this, go to Yard and Garden, and um, this guide will be listed there, and you'll have the option to purchase it. Um, the price is just the price of shipping, so it's probably about $5. And once the beneficial guide is ready, that will go on this website as well. So I'll be sending out an email to the IPM, the vegetable IPM advisories list to let you know when these are up. And if you're not on that list and you want to know, just email me. So here's another resource that I really like, especially for production of vegetables. It's the extension website. And then this specific link right here for fruits, vegetables, and herbs um, gives you really good information. This is what the page looks like when you click on that. Um, it gives a list of vegetables that you might be growing and fruits. And then if you click on one of those vegetables, this is the tomato page, 
it shows you information like what varieties you might want to try in Utah, soil preparation, planting, irrigation, fertilizing, harvesting, and then any problems you might come across. So that would be insects or diseases. And it doesn't, it's not all inclusive, but it does mention some. And then there are videos that that you can watch. So this is a great place to go for specific production information. There's also production information in the Utah Vegetable Production and Pest Management Guide. This website is vegetableguide.usu.edu. It has production information and insect information and diseases, as well as integrated pest management overview and then pesticide and herbicide tables, which are really nice if you have found an insect pest or diseases and you need to make a treatment, you're to that point where it's gonna cause damage and that's the last resort and you need to make a treatment, then you have um, a whole table there of options that you can choose from. Okay, so are there any questions up to that point about resources or anything like that? There is not, Cammy. There was one question about um, about C CUs, pesticide CUs, and whether those are available or not for this webinar. Yes, they are. Um, you can email me for those CEUs. My email um, is cami.cannon at usu.edu. Um, so email me if you need to get that, and I will send it to you. Thank okay. You. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about some insect pests and disease pests. And like I said, I can't talk about all of them. So I just chose the ones that I saw a lot of last year that were causing problems. So um, there are more insect pests than diseases. Um, and if you are interested about learning more about any of these, or if you have questions about other things, you can always email me or use those resources that I just showed you. So um, first, we will talk about aphids. Um, so the threat level of aphids is that they're common, but they're usually not harmful unless they are vectoring a virus or are present in high populations. And the reason I mention them today is because I saw both of those last year. I saw very high populations and viruses caused by aphids. So on um, these pictures you can see on the left side, there are a lot of aphids. These are winged aphids. So um, adults can be wingless, like this middle picture, or winged, like this left picture. And they are just covering this tomato leaf, and the entire plant was covered. And this was um, in a community garden that I later saw um, a virus vectored by aphids in. So when you're seeing this many aphids, it's likely that they're gonna cause damage or they're gonna spread a virus to some of your plants. Um, and then on the far right, this is a corn husk leaf. And you can see that there are just tons of aphids here. The white parts are the aphid skins and there are adults and nymphs and it's just completely infested. Um, so the, I saw some damage on the corn husk due to this infestation and that was also in the community garden. So some important hosts, they have a really wide range but hosts that I like to look out for are tomato, pepper, potato, pea, bean, and cucurbits. And the reason I like to look out for these is that these are the ones that can get viruses spread by aphids. So um, the diseases that aphids transmit in Utah are alfalfa mosaic virus, which you can see a picture of the symptoms in this left picture. Um, that's on a pepper plant. And there's cucumber mosaic virus, potato virus Y, which you can see on this middle image on a potato plant, um, and then watermelon mosaic virus, which is on this far right image, which that is the virus that I saw last season. Um, I actually also saw alfalfa mosaic virus. So both of these virus, viruses occurred last season. Um, I noticed them toward the end of the season. So um, this picture on the left just shows, this is what the um, corn ear looked 
crypt-like that was infested with corn leaf aphids. So you can see there's some damage showing on the outside. And as soon as I opened up the husks, I, I knew why, because there was just tons of aphids all over. So the time for concern with aphids is mid-April through the end of the growing season. So that's basically all season. Um, and you just want to be monitoring and watching for rapidly increasing populations and feeding damage. Some ways to manage aphids are to avoid excess nitrogen because this can attract aphids and encourage natural enemies by providing um, pollen and nectar resources and also avoiding using broad spectrum pesticides. So broad spectrum pesticides would be neonicotinoids, organophosphates, pyrethroids, and carbamates. Uh, another way to manage aphids are to keep the crop area weed free because weeds can harbor the viruses that aphids spread, but they can also harbor aphid populations. So you want to keep the area around your crops as weed free as possible. Um, so for virus management, uh, you want to use resistant cultivars when available and plant early because um, Crops, a lot of crops that are planted late, if they're young during the peak um, viral season, then their symptoms of the viruses are going to be a lot more intense. So planting them earlier will help them grow to a bigger point when the viruses are at their peak and the spread of viruses are at their peak. So it'll help combat that a little bit. And then you want to remove and destroy infected plants immediately because they can serve as reservoirs of the virus. So deciding when to treat, um, it's different for everyone. So you have to um, decide on your own thresholds, your own economic thresholds. But if populations are high and causing damage, or if vectored viruses can't be tolerated, like in seed produ production, um, there's a grower in North Logan that grows potatoes for seed production and their toleration of aphids is very low because they can spread the potato virus Y. And if that's present in any of the seeds, the entire batch will be rejected. Um, so it's a big deal in that situation. Um, and then if the vectored viruses are occurring, then you might want to consider treatment. So this is just a picture again of that corn husk and you can see when I opened it there were just aphids everywhere so are there any questions about aphids before we move on yeah there is uh, Dean says I have aphids that infest my yucca filamentosa uh, do you do do they typically spread to other plants or vegetables um, it depends on what type of aphids they are um, so some are specific to certain kinds of plants and some species are specific to vegetables. So I would get those identified just to see what kind they are. And I don't know a lot about ornamental plants and those insects that infest those, but there could be some overlap. So maybe go to your county extension office and see if they can help you identify maybe what kind of aphid it is, even though I will say that identifying aphids is very difficult, so um, it might be hard to tell. Maybe a better, say, oh, what? I was going to say another suggestion. Uh, if you can get a good picture, you could go to ask.extension.org, and you could submit a picture there, and uh, possibly we could find an expert that might be able to identify it. Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. I didn't know about that. Cool. Thank you. And you could also just see look at your yucca plant and kind of get an idea of what those aphids look like and then look at your garden plants and if you see aphids that look similar and they're close by then you know that kind of might be a sign that they're spreading so mm -hmm. hopefully that helps julie says uh, can you use a trap crop that aphids will go to yes you can use trap crops for aphids you can use trap crops for a lot of insects i don't know any specific crops off the top of my head um, but there are publications out there that um, people have done research on what trap crops attract aphids the most and what ones are most applicable to certain situations so um, if you want to learn more about that i can research that and you can email me so, and then one more. Pat says, uh, "Can you mention alpha uh, 
aphid control in roses. Aphid control in roses. I know they're so common in roses. Um, it's it's not as easy for me to talk about that because I know a lot more about vegetable aphid control. But I know if you're growing, well, I would say one way that I've done it is you can just wash the aphids off the rose leaves and use soapy water. Um, the soap will kind of suffocate them. So that's one way to do it that I know of. But I could look into more options if you email me. So. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. All right. So let's move on to caterpillar pests of brassicas. Now, these are really common. Um, you may have seen them without realizing what they were, but um, they cause feeding damage in brassicas, which would be like kale, broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, stuff like that. Um, and the, dam the contamination that they cause is because the larva will be present in a lot of the harvested products or their excrement will be present, which people don't like to see or eat. So um, that's part of how they damage. And they also, the feeding damage you can see in this center picture is that they just bite out big chunks of um, the crops. So on the left, you can see this is the cabbage looper. You know it because of its looping shape as it moves. Um, this is the diamondback moth in the middle. And on the right is the cabbage white butterfly, which is that white butterfly that you see hovering over your plants all summer long. That's this, this guy. <laughs> so um, another um, name for that one is imported cabbage worm. And uh, cabbage looper and the cabbage white butterfly are a lot more common in home garden brassicas, while the diamondback moth is more common in commercial brassica crops. But they all cause similar damage, and you can manage them all in the same way. So important hosts would be brassicas, like I said, so broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, kale, mustard, radish. And you can see the damage in these three pictures up top. Um, just taking away a lot of the leaf mass, which if you're harvesting cabbage can be a big deal because that's the part that you eat, um, and kale as well. So um, these guys are kind of a big threat for those crops. Um, so you want to monitor for them starting in early May and throughout harvest or as soon as you plant your brassicas outside. Um, one way you can monitor only for cabbage looper and diamondback moth is with pheromone traps. And then um, besides that, you can just scout for the caterpillars on the plants, look for their feeding damage, and also their eggs. Um, and the cabbage white butterfly, you can see flying around. So that one's pretty easy to spot. Um, but one of the main management solutions that I know of, at least for small acreage farms or backyard gardens, is to use row covers and put them on right after you plant or transplant. Um, and this just helps keep the adults from laying eggs on your plants. Um, another way to help is to remove plant debris at the end of the season so that they're not overwintering on your farm or garden. You can hand pick and destroy the larva, which would be more applicable for smaller acreage farms. And then for an organic op option, you can use Bt or spinosad, and those are effective insecticides that are organic. So, um, deciding when to treat, um, the general threshold is when one larva has been found in 25 to 50 plants, or 10% of the plants have at least one larva. Um, this is especially true for heading crops like Brussels sprouts and broccoli and cauliflower, um, but non-heading crops, um, they can tolerate a little higher population of the caterpillar pests. So moving on to corn earworm, um, I'll stop for questions after corn earworm. Um, um, so this is the most destructive insect pest of sweet corn in Utah, and it, it can um, attack tomato and pepper, but it strongly prefers corn. Um, this is a common pest that many of you have probably seen. It's more common to be present in the top part of the corn kernel, or top part of the ear corn, and um, 
this right here in the middle is a picture of an exit hole after the larva has um, exited and becomes an adult, like this on the far right. Um, so important hosts are mainly corn, but also tomato and pepper can be hosts as well. So this middle picture is more typical of what you would see the damage from a corn earworm because the eggs are laid on the, the silks of the corn. And then when they hatch, they crawl into the ear and feed on the kernels of corn. So monitoring you want to start in mid-July and then continue throughout out harvest. Adults are first seen as early as May or as late as August and um, in corn a really helpful way to monitor is to use helioth heliothis traps. Um, you place them out in June along the edges of the crop field and keep moving them throughout the season to keep near fresh corn silk because that's where the adults are going to be visiting and laying their eggs. And you'll want to check these traps twice weekly um, until you have your first catch. And then you'll want to check daily for the best results. Um, and this just helps give you an idea of when to treat and how big the population might be. Um, so management would be plant-resistant corn varieties with long, tight husks. Um, that helps keep the larva from entering the corn ear. And then also to plant corn early so that you're harvesting before 1300 degree days, which is around July 20th or August 5th, if that's a possibility for you. Um, and that just helps avoid the, the peak flight time of the corn earworm. So deciding when to treat, you can use your trap numbers and calculate the average number of moths per night and then use thresholds that are um, established. We have them on the Vegetable Guide website. So if you have any questions about that, you can email me. Okay, so are there any questions? No questions at this time. Okay, awesome. Okay, so this one's kind of an exciting insect. It's the brown marmorated stink bug. Um, it's exciting for me because I like entomology, but it's not exciting for vegetable growers because it can cause a lot of damage. So it's a new invasive species in Utah, but it has potential to cause severe crop damage. Um, you can see this is what the eggs look like on the far left. They have this characteristic black triangle on them as they get close to hatch. In the center is a nymph, one stage of the nymph, and on the far right is the adult. Um, so important hosts, um, there's a wide range of hosts, um, but so far in Utah, we just barely started um, monitoring for this pest in vegetables last year, and we found damage on popcorn and squash, and we've been monitoring for them in fruit for a couple years, but we first found damage last year as well on apple and peach. So in these photos on the far left, you can see the damage on the popcorn. It was only in the leaves that we saw damage, and it was these white spots where they had been feeding and removing the plant parts, plant cells. And then um, this picture in the middle, um, squash I hear is not a big host of BMSB, which is another name for brown marmorated stink bug. So if I say that, BMSB, that's what I'm referring to. But you can see the stylet, which is the feeding mouth part, is stuck into this leaf. And you can see the damage are these yellow spots all over the leaf. And we only saw damage on the leaf in squash as well. But then damage on fruit occurs as what we call cat facing, which is what you see on this peach right here. It's just a deformed looking fruit. So um, crops at risk for BMSB, very susceptible crops are sweet corn, bell pepper, green, pe green bean, and tomato. And you can see the damage up here. These kernels look kind of deflated where they are feeding on this pepper. Um, damage is similar on tomato where there are these light colored areas where they've been feeding and that can sometimes deform the fruit as well. And then you can see this damaged green bean as well. Um, less susceptible crops would be okra and eggplant. And then crops that are minorly fed on are squash, cucumber, broccoli, and collards. So um, this is a pest that 
we're watching out for, but it's good for you to watch out for too. And um, just know that it's on the horizon and it's very good at, at invading new areas. So it's likely going to become a more prominent pest in Utah, unfortunately. Um, so monitoring time is July through harvest, but um, highest populations occur in August. So that's the main time you want to watch out for damage. And infestations typically occur along filled edges. So this is a great place to focus your scouting for this insect. Um, so you want to look on the filled edges for adults or eggs. Um, and then you can also shake foliage of plants that might have might have VMSB in them over a beading sheet or a white piece of paper and see if any adults or nymphs fall out onto your sheet. And the way we trap for BMSB is, you can see in this picture to the left, we use two ferricone lures. There's a BMSB lure and a green stink bug lure. And then we have this ferricone sticky panel. And the um, the BMSB are attracted to the ferricone lures or the pheromone lures and then they get stuck on this panel and that helps you to know if they're present and maybe how high the populations could be getting. Um, another thing is just to watch for feeding injury on fruits and vegetables but be aware that there are other stink bug pests that cause similar damage. So if you're just seeing the damage and you don't see the adults that are definitely BMSB, then it could be something else. So just be aware of that as you're monitoring. Um, some management options, there aren't very many because this is a very robust insect that um, is really strong against insecticides. So it's not very, the knockdown capability of insecticides with BMSB is not very high. <laughs> um, but one way to manage them is to use trap crops as a barrier around the border of cash crops because they like the borders. They might stick in those trap crops. Um, one trap crop that I do know of is sunflower. And um, other ways to help, which might be impractical for larger scale operations, is to use row covers or fine mesh netting over the plants or the fruits individually. Um, so you can see why that's not practical for large scale operations. And then um, you wanna make sure you're attracting and conserving natural enemies. There is a really, there's a key parasitoid wasp that really helps um, keep the populations of BMSB low. And we haven't found it in Utah yet, but the more we can attract and conserve those natural enemies, we might be able to find that one parasitoid wasp that does a really good job of keeping BMSB under control. So try not to use broad spectrum insecticides and try to provide pollen and nectar resources to attract these natural enemies. Um, and then insecticides are often necessary with BMSB because they are so robust, like I said. Um, so when to treat, there are varying suggestions on thresholds, but some suggest um, a threshold of 10 adults caught per trap per week. Um, there might be more information on that that is coming because this is a, an insect that's constantly being studied. So are there any questions about BMSB? I think you hit it right there at the end. Jack asked about biological controls for the stink bug. Yeah, so it's a very interesting topic because um, the BMSB is from Asia and its biological, its main biological control there is called Trisulcus japonicus and it's this tiny, tiny parasitoid wasp. It's really cute. <laughs> and um, it inserts its eggs into the brown marmoted stink bug eggs and those eggs are very successful at killing the BMSB eggs and then coming out as a wasp so it can go on to do more of that. So it's, it's effective in Asia and BMSV is not actually a big pest there. Um, so there's a lot of research being done and that Trisulcus japonicus has been found in the US occurring naturally 
So in some states, they can release it, but it hasn't been found in Utah yet. So we're not allowed to release it, but we're constantly looking for it so that we can, because <laughs> it would be great help. So. And on the formal section, uh, there was uh, Eric asked about, uh, are there any corn varieties that are resistant to, to uh, earworm? Yeah, there are some corn varieties that have tighter husks right at the top. So it, it helps keep the larva out of the corn ear. And I don't know the variety names, but if you email me, I can find out. Um, some people also put clothespins at the top of their corn husk to kind of keep that area tight and keep the insect out. But um, for a large production, that wouldn't really be practical. So. Okay. All right. Okay, so moving on, sorry, to the two-spotted spider mite. This is a really small insect pest. Um, so these images are all with a microscope, but I just wanted you to get an idea of what it looks like close up. Um, this middle image shows two of them, and there's an egg right here. So the reason they're called two-spotted spider mite is you can see these black spots on either side of their body. Um, so if not controlled, this pest can kill plants. Um, their populations can get really high and they feed on the plants and take out the chlorophyll and cause the plants to become dry and eventually die. So um, one thing with two-spotted spider mite is when you're looking for them, you look under the, the leaf of the plant that you think they might be on and they're really difficult to see because they're so small they might look like just specks of dirt. Um, but if you shake the plant over a beading tray or a white sheet of paper and then you see those specks of dirt moving around, then that's how you know that there's spider mites, at least two spotted spider mites on your plants. Um, so these images show crazy infestations that I saw last year of two spotted spider mites. On the left, this is a bean leaf and you can just see this, all of this yellow patch right here and all these tiny spider looking insects are the spider mites. So there were a ton, the most I've ever seen on any plant. And then this leaf in the middle is a tomato leaf from this plant on the right and you can just see the damage that they cause occurs as this white um, stippling um, and you can also see the webbing on this image and the middle one. And the the infestation was so bad on this tomato plant that you can see on this right image that they were even feeding on the tomato fruit, which is, um, I've never seen it until I saw it on this plant. So they were, you can see those tiny yellow spots are where they were feeding. Um, so there was a lot of feeding damage all over the plant. So as you might have read, the important hosts are beans, peas, tomatoes. And one thing I see a lot in community gardens is people will plant their peas and they'll leave them out all summer long. Um, and because peas are a cold, hardy plant, during the hot months of the summer, they just, they're dying. And that death um, and the hot and dry weather can attract spider mites and then they can likely spread to other plants in the garden. So it's a good idea to remove plants that are dying and drying up um, instead of keeping them there because they might harbor um, these pest populations. So time for concern with these are anytime the weather conditions are hot and dry. And you want to, like I said, check the undersides of the leaves and look for moving dirt. And in the beginning, they'll start on the lower, older leaves closer to the ground. So you can start your monitoring there. Um, management options are just to... Um, keep your plants free of drought stress and keep them happy and healthy um, and then avoid broad spectrum pesticides and that's really important because there are a lot of natural beneficial mites that are natural predators of the two-spotted spider mite and these broad spectrum pesticides will kill off the natural enemies that are helping and then the uh, two-spotted spider mites population can just boom after that because they don't have that natural enemy helping keep their populations low. Um, so one thing about spider mites is that they're highly resistant to pesticides. So um, you just have to be careful about when you decide to treat them and if you decide to treat them. 
but times you might want to consider it is if they're easily detectable, like this picture, you can see this whole plant is just dying because of the spider mites that were there. And you can kind of see in the background that these other plants were healthy compared to this one. Um, so if the damage is evident and the hot and dry conditions persist, then you might want to consider treatment. Um, so this is just a really interesting video, two videos. Um, showing this crazy infestation that I saw on the bean plant. So you can see these tiny spider mites moving around. Um, they're moving along on that web that they've made. And this infestation was just crazy. <laughs> it's cool to watch, but um, this was toward the end of the season. So by that time, everything was kind of drying out and dying. So that could be why the population had gotten so high. And I don't think anything had been done to manage their populations. So do we have any questions before we go on? No, there was one question about uh, a good way to get images of insects. And I put a link in uh, chat to learn.extension.org. It was actually a really good webinar I did. Uh, let's see, that would have been almost two years ago now, but uh, Dana Wolf is out of Ohio, and she takes wonderful pictures, and in fact, I think a link to her website, she does it sort of as a hobby on the side, but the title of that webinar was Macro Photography on a Budget, and um, so she sort of walks you through some uh, relatively cheap ways to take good images of very small things, so if you're interested in doing that, uh, I put a link to that in chat. Awesome, yeah. Uh, no other questions. Or, well, well, we just had a couple pop in. Hang on a sec. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, do, uh, do the mites vector viruses? Mm, not that I know of. Okay. Um, but I don't know everything about viruses, so uh -huh. I could be wrong on that. Okay. And then Catherine says, uh, what what uh, what's what is the duration? Or, okay, she asked about the webinar. I think the one that I linked to, and um, it, it's about an hour long. So it's it's you know quite a, a bit of time. But it, it's she she's really th thorough in the the webinar though. And some things I do when I'm were they looking for how to find good images or how to take good images? Uh, that I thought the original question was, and let me go back and look. Um, yeah, the original question was, how do you get good close-up pictures of, oh. of these pests? Yeah, so there, I know for iPhones, at least, you can buy macro lens attachments, and they just, on my phone, you can see, they, they just kind of go over the top of your lens, yeah. and then um, it'll help magnify what you're looking at, um, mm -hmm. and that really helps, yeah, when you're trying to identify something, if you have a picture you can compare to online, mm -hmm. That's a really good way. So if you have more and questions, I can, you can email and, me. But. Yeah, and again, um, I'll put a plug in for if you go to ask.extension.org. Uh, you know, that works really well on you. I, I actually use it, um, you know, I'm a part of the e-extension, so I, I do some back-end work on it, but I use it just as a, a regular user. If you browse the website on your phone, you if you've taken a picture with your phone, you have the ability to upload those images directly to the website. And again, we'll route that at an, on, a, on a national level. We'll route your question to an expert who uh, will be able to answer that question. Uh, so Catherine was asking about the webinar we're on now. And so uh, Catherine, this webinar is an hour long, so we've only got about 15 more minutes left. And yes, it will be available for viewing after the fact uh, at the LEARN event at learn.extension org. Um, Melanie says, are there any trap crops for spider mites? Hmm. There probably are, but I don't know what they are. So if you want to, um, let me put my email in the chat. Let's see. Yeah, I think you'll go up top in the little dot, dot, dot. Oh, dot, dot, dot. And then okay. choose chat. Okay, I'm going to put my email in here. And um, you can email me if you have more questions about trap crops, and I can do some more research and find out some options for you. So. And then Stephanie says, are there organic ways to kill spider mites? Um, yes, there are options. Um, I can't think of them off the top of my head. So, yeah, you'll have to email me for that one, too. Sorry. Alrighty. 
Okay, so we don't have very much time left, so I'm just going to quickly mention these last two diseases. Tomato or tobacco mosaic virus is a virus that I saw last year, and it's a pretty serious virus because it can survive for up to 50 years in plant debris and up to weeks for or months on trellises or wooden stakes. So once it's present, um, you have to be really careful about the way you handle those plants that have it. And you want to properly identify it so that you're not kind of freaking out if it's something else. Because there are other things that kind of look like that. Um, so hosts that are important in Utah are tomato. Um, I don't know if anyone grows tobacco here, but that's a big host as well. And then other solanaceous plants. And it can spread by seed, by human handling. Um, it can enter a plant through a wound as small as torn plant hairs. So even just brushing up against the plant that's infected and then brushing up against a healthy plant can spread the disease. And sometimes it can be spread by chewing insects. So you want to watch for this throughout the growing season and make sure you get it identified if you see symptoms that um, look like this. And then if you do get it um, confirmed as this mosaic virus, then you want to remove the infected plants immediately. And um, before the season even starts, you can look for certified disease-free seed and use resistant varieties. Once you have it, there aren't chemical controls, so prevention is the main option for that one. And then watermelon mosaic virus is spread by aphids. So when I saw all of those um, infestations of aphids, they were probably related to the fact that I also saw watermelon mosaic virus this season. So you can see the symptoms on this left picture. That's supposed to be a pumpkin, and it doesn't look anything like a pumpkin. Um, so this color, color um, blocking or this mosaic pattern on these fruits is one of the symptoms. You can see it on the center image as well. And then the leaves, they kind of look like herbicide damage. So um, if you do see that, just um, we want to make sure that it's not herbicide damage um, because it could be either one. So it's pretty widespread in Utah, especially on watermelon, squash, and sometimes cantaloupe. So I only saw it on pumpkins last year. But you can see on the underside of this pumpkin leaf, these are all aphids. So they were hanging out on the plant that they infected with the virus. Um, and time for concern is June or earlier if you um, if the winter was mild or if you're planting in high tunnels until the end of the season. And um, first symptoms are usually seen on filled edges. That's where I saw both of the ones on, on pumpkin that I saw. And you want to monitor the aphid activity starting in June and just, you know, watch for increasing populations and watch for feeding damage. Um, and part of the management is to control weeds because they can harbor the virus and also harbor these aphid populations. Rotate your crops, um, use resistant varieties when available, and be aware that insecticides um, applied for controlling aphids are not, are not very valuable to control this disease. Um, and then again, be aware that the damage looks like herbicide damage. So that's it. Um, here's my email and email me if you want the CEU pesticide use management credit. And thank you all. So we'll open it up to questions now. Okay. Uh, let's see. Monica says she, uh, I presume sterilizing tools between use as you would for fire blight is a good idea. Yes, definitely for tobacco and tomato mosaic virus it is because it can transfer on, on tools. Mm -hmm. Uh, Audrey says, uh, where, do you, where do you get certified disease-free tomato seed? Um, there is a Cornell. Cornell has a website that has disease-free options for every vegetable you would be planting. Um, so if you email me, I can send you that link. It has a very long list. Um, and then you just have to look at wherever you buy your seeds. Look for those... Um, It'll say on the seed packet if it's disease free. So, um, okay. yeah, you just have to watch for that. Audra says, does washing off aphids help reduce damage and or virus transmission? Um, virus transmission, um, it 
it could have transmitted before you even notice that the aphids are there. So um, it might might not be that much help, but it could help with aphid damage. And if you have a small garden, it might be worth your time. If you have a big farm or lots of plants that have aphids on it, it might not be worth your time. So it just kind of depends, um, but it can help reduce the populations. Nate asks about grasshopper control. Okay, so um, grasshoppers are a community-wide pest. So even if you're controlling it on your plot of land, if your neighbor isn't and um, they have a lot of grasshoppers, they're very likely to move into your plant. So one thing to do with grasshoppers is to team up with your neighbors and find a way to manage the grasshoppers that works best for everyone. Um, and there are some really good fact sheets about that on the Utah Pest website. So if you just Google grasshopper control USU extension, um, it might, it'll probably be one of the first options that comes up. But one other thing that I like that's organic is something called um, nolobate or semispore. And it's a a bait that you put out that the grasshoppers eat, and you're supposed to put it out um, as soon as you start seeing nymphal grasshoppers, so when they're young, and they eat this bait, and it causes them to get kind of like a flu, and it can be spread. So once they die, um, other grasshoppers will eat those dead, infected grasshoppers, and then they'll get the sort of flu, and it'll help spread that. Um, and it can be helpful. It kind of depends on how big the populations are. Um, but that's one good option that I like. And you want to apply it often, especially if it gets wet. It's not attractive to the grasshoppers anymore. So you either want to cover it by putting it inside of um, a PVC pipe or something so it doesn't get wet, or just make sure you are applying it consistently so that it's always dry and attractive. Uh, Stephanie says, do you send out emails or post anywhere when you are seeing certain diseases and or big pest infestations during the growing season? Yes, I do. So we have IPM pest advisories. Let me see if I can share. I think it's worth taking the time to do this. So I'm going to. Now you'll probably want to. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, do new share and share either your web browser, just your whole. Okay. okay I'm, I'm so. Okay, good. On the utahpest.usu.edu, you come here and there's IPM Pest Advisories right here. Um, that will take you straight to the advisories, I think. Let me click there. Yes, so these are the advisories that go out um, monthly or biweekly or weekly, depending on which one you're following. And you can subscribe right here. And it'll take you to this link and then it'll bring up this page where you enter your email address, your county, and then which um, advisories you want. So that's a really good way to stay updated on what's going on. Um, we try to be really concurrent with that and tell you exactly what we're seeing out there. So all the stuff I talked about today that I was seeing, I was putting it on these advisories. Okay, good. And again, I'll put a link to the learn event. If, if you didn't get all that, folks, just again, you can go back and watch the video once it's on YouTube. So you can pause it and slow it down and look for the, the links and get all that. Uh, again, that'll be, there'll be a link to the video at the learn event I just put in chat. Um, let's see, Michelle says uh, squash bug control. Oh, yeah, I thought that might come up. Squash bugs are <laughs> a real big issue. Um, they're just always there and they're pretty hard to control too. But one way to control them is to use, um, let's see, I'm trying to remember the name. It's kale and clay. And it's, um, it's kind of like this white powder that you put around the base of the plant. Um, they like to hang out in the base of the plant and that kale and clay um, messes with their, I think it's like the outer shell of their body or something, but it's able to control them um, maybe not all the way, but it's a good way to at least see if it works in your production system. Um, other ways, there's a video on um, USU YouTube's, USU Extension, their YouTube channel, 
Ron Patterson has a video about how to control them with water. So you can pour water at the base of the plant and they don't like that, so they start crawling out of where they're hiding and then you can squash them with your hands. <laughs> or if you don't like doing that, I like to have like a bucket of soapy water and you can just pick them up and throw them in there. Um, that's a little less gross. So. <laughs> Earl says, uh, please list the, the bait names, but I'm not sure. Okay, the for the grasshoppers. Well, yeah, I'm not. Uh, I, 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 I don't know. I, you've talked about. I, I don't know how much bait you, you, you talked about. So if that's the only thing you talked okay. about regarding bait, then I'll write it right so. now. Okay. Grasshopper baits. There's Nolo bait or Seamospor. I might spell it wrong. It's either okay. Seamospor or. Okay. Seem O spore. <laughs> yeah, and they, Earl came back and said, "Yeah, he's he's talking about for for grasshoppers." Okay, yeah. Okay. Um, the the name of the it's called Nosema locusta. That's the name of the the biological agent that is acting to cause that virus. So you can search that too. Okay, uh, Meredith says, "Did you mean?" diatomaceous earth instead of kale and clay for, for squash bugs? Um, so kale and clay I've heard is a little more effective but diatomaceous earth can also be used. I think they're similar in the way they work but I yeah I have heard that kale and clay is more effective mm -hmm. and hopefully I'm not wrong on that one. <laughs> okay but just can, uh, yeah. No more questions at this time. Let's take another 30 seconds. We've still got uh, technically about two minutes left. So we'll hang around for another 30 seconds if folks have questions. While we do that, I'm going to look up squash bug control so I can see, I can tell you right now if Caitlin Clay was the right one. Might take a minute to find. <laughs> So this is one of our fact sheets on squash bugs. And I'm just going to search for kale and clay. Yes, OK. So kale and clay is an option. And the brand name is called Surround. Yeah, in fact, so, someone, someone just put that in chat, said kale and, yeah. kale and clay is called Surround. Awesome, perfect. Yeah, good thing we have some knowledgeable yeah. attendees. <laughs> Kay says, is food grade DE effective for pest control? Um, I don't know what that means. Yeah, food grade? Food grade and then capital D, capital E, effective for mm -hmm. pest control. Okay, if you want to see sure. if you clarify or add more. Uh, Stephanie says, unrelated to pests, do you know if it's safe to use fertilized and treated lawn clippings for mulch in your vegetable garden? Hmm. That's a good question. Um, I think, I know that when it's raining and after winter and everything it can leach out some of the things that are in plants so i don't know that's a really good question that i, I would have to look just up. as a, from an anecdotal standpoint i use every spring i'll typically you know the grass tends to grow faster i always have a lot of grass clippings i i typically use my grass clippings for uh, mulch in my vegetable garden early in spring when i have a lot of those clippings um although i don't fertilize heavily and i generally don't spray anything in my grass so yeah i know i know it's commonly used but i don't i don't know about the effects of the fertilizer or anything so. uh let's see k clarified i think the diet i think the de was diatomaceous earth so oh food, yeah okay food, food uh, grade, um, safe, safe for for humans you know i don't i don't know i've heard of people that drink it <laughs> But I am not positive on that one, so it's something you'd have to look up. Yeah. Um, I would assume it is. But well, she said, "Yeah, it, it, is it effective on pests and then ants?" Is what she. Um, I'm not sure about ants. I think there would probably be something more effective for ants. Like I know, baiting traps for ants is pretty effective. So. Um, Ryan Davis at the Utah Plant Pest Diagnostics Lab is a really good person to ask about 
those urban pests like ants and stuff. So I'll just put his email in the chat. So, somebody mentioned in chat, you might mention the diagnostic clinics at Ogden Botanical Gardens and the Botanical Center in Kaysville. Yeah, that's, so there are um, help desks that you can get things identified at. I think at several of the um, county extension offices and yes, there are, um, I don't know the exact location of the diagnostic clinics in Ogden. Oh, I guess it's the Ogden Botanical Gardens and the Botanical Center in Kaysville. So yeah, those are really good resources for people that could help you identify things. And I'll put, again, I'll put, another, I'll put a little plug in, again, for ask.extension.org. Uh, again, that's, if you have a picture of something or just have a question, you can ask there, and it's also mobile ready, too. So if you're out in the garden, if you've got your phone with you, you can snap a picture and then make a submission right there. Okay, no more questions. I think we're good, Cami. Uh, once again, it was a pleasure. Any closing thoughts? Oh, just thank you all for coming. It was awesome to talk to you about insect pests and diseases. And yeah, if you have any more questions, just email me. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, and happy gardening. <laughs> Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.